Greetings and welcome to chapter two. Um, for this class for global, we're uh, we're still we're about halfway through. This is going to take about halfway through uh, part one of the book, which remember is about laying foundation. So this chapter about politics, law, and economics is the second chapter. Uh, we just obviously finished globalizing business for chapter one. Uh, we'll have two more for part one, which will be uh, culture, ethics, and norms. And then the last one will be how we're going to leverage resources and capabilities uh, to conclude the foundation. And then we'll start on part two with acquiring the tools after that. So uh, let's get started with this chapter. Again, I, I please I urge you to uh, get your textbook handy as you follow this lecture and make sure that uh, you follow the book. It's the best way to do this. You have the slides handy, have the book handy as well. Uh, we're on page 20, 21. And I do recommend that you uh, read uh, the opening case of uh, the U.S. being a newest, uh, the newest transition economy. Um, this is going to be really important uh, in terms of uh, a way for us to, to understand this chapter, but also there, there's going to be some statistics that I'll be showing you, some, uh, some data, uh, some rankings. And, and when you look at the rankings, then this, this uh, will you know, be aligned uh, with the opening case and it'll make more sense. All right, let's get cracking. So the first thing I wanted to do before uh, we even talk about anything is uh, show you an old clip here. Uh, this is from uh, a CNN uh, GPS uh, with uh, Fareed Zachariah. And uh, I, um, it, I always enjoy this little story. Um, I, uh, well, let's see if it plays here. There we go. Now for our What in the World segment, here's what got my attention this week. A roll of toilet paper. Certainly not the normal subject for us here at GPS, but this is special toilet paper. Cuban toilet paper. It turns out Cuba may be running out of the stuff. The government has warned its citizens in recent days that they are facing a toilet paper shortage. And they added this paucity of paper could last until the end of the year when they expect a shipment to come in. So how did this happen? Well, the Cubans blame it on the global financial crisis and the hurricanes they were hit with last year. Now the financial crisis is hurting everyone, but I have yet to hear of shortfalls in toilet paper in other places. What I think is really at the bottom of this toilet paper crisis is Cuba's continuing commitment to its bizarro world of socialist economics. Just two weeks ago, Raul Castro vowed yet again to keep communism alive in Cuba to make sure capitalism doesn't return. In a world of flux, I suppose it is comforting to know that some things stay the same. Cuba's disastrous economy would be a joke were it not for the poverty it has perpetuated among millions of Cubans. The whole country is stagnating. 50% of its arable fields are going unfarmed. First and second year college students now work one month out of the year in agriculture. Its insane farm policies lead to frequent shortages of fruit, vegetables and other basic food needs, shortages even more serious than toilet paper. And all those programs they've held up for years as successes of the communist revolution, free education for all, through college, universal health care, well, Raul Castro just announced they're going to have to make cuts in all of these. Meanwhile, the average Cuban still earns the equivalent of less than $20 per month. Now, All right, you get the idea? Um, so the learning outcomes uh, for, for this uh, chapter, first we're going to look at the two types of institutions and how they reduce uncertainty. And remember the theme. Let's see if you remember there is a theme in every single chapter uh, and institution is going to play a role in that theme. Uh, how they reduce uncertainty. Just when you think about institutions, just think about anything that has uh, law and order and that um, you know, you, you're able to to rely on, right? So that's really what we're doing here. Uh, the two core propositions underpinning an institution-based view of global business, uh, the difference between democracy and totalitarianism, and uh, the difference among civil law, common law, and theocratic law, uh, the importance of property rights and intellectual property rights. And I promise you that when we look at property rights, um, hopefully, uh, you'll see what a big impact it has on uh, the American economy, but also uh, the uh, uh, you know, democracies of the world. 
a list of differences among market economy, the command economy, and the mixed economy, and uh, why it's important to understand the different institutions when doing uh, business abroad. All right, so now let's see. Oops, let's go here. Sorry, just making sure here. There we go. Um, so moving along, uh, what we know is uh, that nothing is static when it comes to the rules of the game, right? Uh, that the, you have something called an institutional transaction, which is fundamental comprehensive change introduced to the formal and informal rules of the game. So if you're a company, you're an MNC, you're, you're any company, uh, the fact that these things are not static, they're very dynamic, is going to affect how you're going to adapt to uh, the change in these transactions, right? And if, so there we go, it affects firms as players. Um, what we know is that success and failure of firms are determined by how firms quote unquote play the game, right? So again, the notion of when in Rome, do as the Romans, I know we spoke about that last time. It depends on how the rules are made, how they're enforced, and how they're changed. If you can't rely on the institution, we'll, we'll see that you have to go outside of institutions, right? So let's first start with the institution-based view. For survival, firms must monitor, decode, and adapt to the changing rules of the game. Um, you, you have here, with, uh, as, as your author gives us the introduction and even the opening case, uh, the current administration, the Trump administration, um, threatened actually um, a lot of American um, multinationals, uh, car companies namely, it threatened them uh, with uh, taxes or sanctions if they didn't bring jobs back to the U.S., right? Well, you know, if you're just supposed to have a responsibility to your shareholders and your shareholders want a return on investment, and the way you get a return on investment is by, yes, making cars in, in Mexico and Brazil and Canada uh, because that's where the cheaper labor is. In this particular case, you're going to have to turn on a dime and find out, okay, how, how do we adapt? Um, and so, again, this is just, you know, aligned with what we've learned so far in, in this chapter. Uh, dimensions of institutions. Uh, you have uh, here, interesting, when you look at the degree of formality, you have the formal and informal institutions. And if you go all the way to the right, you look at the supportive pillars, you have three. What you want to remember is there's only one for formal institutions, the regulatory pillar. That's for the laws, the regulations, and the rules. However, for the informal institution, you'll have two, the normative and the cognitive, norms, culture, and ethics. So again, if you cannot rely on formal institutions when you're overseas, then you defer to the informal institutions, the norms, the culture, the ethics. So what do we have here again? Uh, what I did is it kind of reiterated what I just had on the previous slide. An example of a, a course of, of regulatory pillar is the IRS, right? See what happens if you don't pay your taxes for several years, you know, you go to jail. So it's coercive is what that is. It's a, it's a coercive uh, a power of government exercised through laws, regulations, and rules. I'm just giving you an example, but it works. You know, it works because a lot of people are not paying taxes because they just love to pay taxes. They're paying taxes because the alternative is not something they they want, right? That's the only formal we have right there as a supportive pillar. The other two, again, the informal, your normative pillar. So the mechanism through which norms influence individual and firm behavior the example that you have here, and this is all on page 22 from your author, is um, how so many companies um, invested in China and India, which is a very smart thing to do. Uh, remember, they're part of the BRICS. We've talked about this. But what's interesting is some companies really are just doing it. They're investing there uh, because that's what their competitors are doing, and they don't really have a clear strategy or clear direction. And that's just a not a, the best approach. You still have to do your homework and you have to do it because it's best for you, not because everybody else is doing it. Uh, I remember, I think it was Bank of America uh, invested in China uh, and it partnered up uh, through a joint venture with a huge Chinese bank. And right after it did that, a bunch of other American banks did that. Uh, I think three years later, uh, B of A realized it was not working out and it severed ties and pulled out of China. 
again, you have to do it because not just everybody's doing it, uh, but a lot of these uh, banks who followed B of A, uh, you know, got left with problems. The cognitive pillar, uh, internalized values and beliefs that guide individual and firm behavior. Um, I know I touched on Enron a little bit before, I think. Uh, this is a, this, you know, this was again, this energy company based in Texas uh, that was, um, I mean, just so, so wrong in terms of on you know, ethics and law and breaking so many codes, uh, lying through its teeth uh, with its earnings, annual report, etc. Uh, but it was allowed to go on for quite some time, right? And so when you look at uh, what happened there with, with Enron, uh, there was a whistleblower. Uh, Enron, it was interesting. Yes, there was a, a whistleblower. She, you know, in fact, I have a little a YouTube video here that I'll just show you about her, and then we'll talk about that a little bit more. Enron has almost two dozen felons, people that either pled guilty or were found guilty in court. I felt like I was the loyal employee, but I have this whistleblower label. My name is Sharon Watkins. I used to be a vice president at the Enron Corporation. I'd been at Enron for eight years and really stumbled across this income statement fraud. I just had a spreadsheet where the math didn't add up and I kept asking question after question. I thought I was putting enough evidence in front of the chairman of Enron's board, but his first action was to see if he could silence the messenger. People say, oh, you're not really a whistleblower, you didn't go outside the company. And I said, that's right. My goal was to have the company live, not go bankrupt. I've been speaking the last decade on the ethical and leadership lessons from Enron's demise. You have people saying you'll never work in corporate America again because people see you walking down the hall. They know you, you know, took this risk, spoke out for truth. Um, and something inside of them just feels uncomfortable because they're not so certain that they would have done the same thing. When you have an ethical challenge, your life's never the same. You're either going to rise to it and try to stop the bad behavior, or you're going to rationalize why, you know, you're staying silent. Something's wrong with our system of checks and balances if we're relying on loan truth tellers to save the day. And so um, we'll, we'll learn a little bit more about Enron in this class, but not as much as uh, you will when you take uh, business ethics uh, with Dr. Carol Dickerson. Um, and I really encourage you to take it, BUS 60. Uh, roles of institutions in reducing uncertainty. So institutions influence uh, decision-making process of individuals and firms by constraining the range of acceptable action. Uh, and so this is where you look at economic uncertainty can lead to transaction cost. This is going to be an important def definition for us, this transaction cost. Um, and um, I'll have a little more about that in just a second. Uh, opportunism is an important source of transaction cost. So this is where we look at something called guile and opportunism, where people, you know, in the middle uh, of this transaction uh, somewhere, uh, will see an opportunity to make an extra buck and, and add to the cost, right? Uh, opportunism is the act of seeking self-interest with guile. Um, this is where we have this uh, important slide here uh, from Oliver Williamson, uh, where you know he uh, he won the Nobel Prize in fact because of his work with transaction cost, so it's a cost associated with economic transaction. Uh, what he said, this is a quote from him: "Do the gears mesh? Are the parts lubricated? Is there needless slippage or other loss of energy?" Uh, I'm not going to show it to you now, but you know it's on the slide. If you want to see uh, the 2009 lecture that he gave when he accepted the Nobel Prize. Uh, he talks about his work uh, on uh, transaction cost. And so what that means is as a multinational, as a company doing business overseas, uh, if you're working uh, for, if, you, if, you, if you're doing business in a country where the rules are not quite enforced, right? Uh, when you look at the, uh, the, the institutional uh, uh, makeup of the laws and the support and the enforcement is not quite there, uh, you're going to see an increase in transaction cost. Uh, again, there's going to be a lot of opportunism, and that's going to add to the bottom line. It's going to 
uh, slow things down for you. It's going to be also a, a, a cost of doing business that is absolutely majorly variable depending on the mood, right? A long time ago, in fact, uh, because of corruption uh, in Russia, I shouldn't say a long time ago, I want to say maybe less than 10 years ago, uh, IKEA, you all know IKEA, IKEA pulled out of Russia completely. Uh, I don't know if they ever went back, but they pulled out. And they pulled out because they got tired of the of the bribes uh, that they had, you know, they were people were trying to get them to pay bribes all the time. All right, so what are the roles of institutions in uh, reducing uncertainty? We're continuing that. Uh, the unstable and unreliable institutional framework, they increase transaction costs. So we just covered that. Uh, they decrease transactions, right? You know, uh, there's going to be a lot of multinationals there. Even the shareholders are going to say, no, I, I don't want you to go to this country because uh, it's, uh, the risk is too high and it's not worth it for us. Uh, we want a return on investment. So you have these transition economies, right? A transition economy is definitely an economy where, uh, you know, there's going to be a decrease in terms of um, uh, the uh, corrupt uh, in terms of the perception of corruption and because there's an increase in corruption. Uh, there's a, a great uh, organization called Transparency International. That's the, the map that I have here on the slide is from Transparency International. And it shows you what's called the Corruption Perception Index. Every year they have one. Uh, you see on the left, bottom left over here, a very, very dark colored, dark red countries have a high corruption perception index and the ones all the way on the right have a very low index. And so the Nordic countries traditionally, Norway, Finland, Sweden, uh, you know, um, New Zealand also, by the way, uh, very, very, very low on the corruption perception index. Uh, the Horn of Africa right there, uh, when you look at uh, uh, Somalia, uh, Somalia ranks, I think, number one in the world uh, for that. Uh, and it's, you know, basically, uh, a failed regime, right? It does. It's, uh, it's really uh, the, the government of Somalia is non-existent. Uh, so the transition economies are emerging economies in which institutional transitions are pervasive. Again, usually this applies to emerging economies. What you will have read from the uh, introduction of this chapter for the opening case on ethical dilemma is that the United States uh, is, you know, uh, appearing to turn into a transition economies. Case in point, even just a very simple example I gave you uh, of, of these um, you know, multinationals that are being threatened if they don't uh, come back to do business here. Uh, this is a little clip from uh, the, uh, uh, again, uh, Transparency International that explains the data for 2019 uh, Corruption Perception Index. Transparency International presents the Corruption Perceptions Index 2019. Using a scale of 0 to 100, where 0 is highly corrupt and 100 is very clean, the CPI analyzes public sector corruption in 180 countries and territories around the world. The top countries are New Zealand and Denmark, while the bottom countries are Somalia, South Sudan, and Syria. However, when it comes to improving on corruption, the majority of countries are stagnating. Our analysis shows how the stream of big money in politics is linked to higher rates of corruption. In fact, low CPI scores are also associated with higher concentrations of power among the rich, while poorer citizens have little to no political influence. But even countries with high CPI scores aren't free of corruption. Multiple scandals show that transnational corruption is often facilitated by countries at the top of the index. Countries where the proceeds of corruption are stashed. To prevent corruption and ensure that politicians and institutions always act in the public interest, governments must meaningfully engage citizens in decision-making processes. Help us spread the word. All right. So um, hopefully that was interesting. Again, uh, you can uh, you know check out the site uh, and um, and look at um, what the rankings are. Uh, New Zealand, you heard, is is as the very very top. We'll talk more about New Zealand. Uh, throughout the semester. Uh, all right, so the institution, the firms, and the behavior. So now we're on page 24. 
And when you, of course, what, you know, this confirms uh, what we talked about before, right? So again, this is a theme for every single chapter where we look at institutions and the firms and uh, how that engages into the firm's behavior, right? So you have a dynamic interaction between the firm and institutions, and then the formal and informal constraints between firm behavior and institution, as well as the industry condition and firm-specific resources and capabilities between the firms and what, how the firm will behave. Um, so the two core propositions of the institution-based view are number one, managers and firms rationally pursue their interest and make choices within the formal and informal constraints in a given institutional framework. This is all fine and dandy, but then what happens if that institutional framework is kind of not really quite there? Well, uh, while formal and informal institutions combine to govern firm behavior, in situations where formal constraints are unclear or fail, informal constraints will play a larger role in reducing uncertainty and provide constancy to managers and firms. So that's, again, what we've talked about before uh, so far in this lecture. All right, now we're switching over to political systems. Uh, very important to know, um, you know, again, you have different ways of looking at them, you know, actually really uh, democracy is usually going to be the key way of looking at them, right? But what I mean is there are different rankings and different flavors of democracy throughout the world. We'll talk about that. Uh, so the rules of the game on how a country is governed politically, uh, there are different types, right? So of course, democracy just talked about that. Uh, you know, elect elected officials. Uh, by the way, elected officials uh, with finite amount of terms, right? Um, you know, Vladimir Putin, who, I mean, if you look it up, I can't even remember how many years he's been in power, but, you know, he was in power uh, once upon a time, and uh, when his term ran out and he stepped down, while he stepped down as the leader, uh, he put in his, uh, his, his college friend uh, Medvedev in power, and Medved Medvedev just changed the constitution which allowed Putin to go back in, and he has been the leader of Russia ever since. So uh, in terms of democracy, you know, uh, Russia is really kind of no longer there. Uh, totalitarian regime, uh, see if you can think of the most totalitarian regime in the world. What country comes to mind when you think about the absolute number one most totalitarian place on the planet? And let's see if you got it right. Uh, so democracy, a political system in which citizens elect representatives to govern uh, on, on their behalf. So what I have here for you is um, I'm going to take a little break and I'm going to show you a video on how to make your own mask. Okay, so we've both got our red cloth. I want everyone to know we didn't organize this beforehand. So but this one's kind of the same size as yours, a decent size. So mine's about the size of a handkerchief. So, yeah, yeah. So I, I've got. I don't know if you have. I've got two hair ties. So maybe you, you might need to tie yours. But mine's not long enough to tie. So I've got two hair ties. Your hair's not long enough for that. So, so I'm then going to turn mine in, fold it in over itself, so that it's. So I folded it like this. Yep. Now yours, is yours just going to tie all the way around your face? No. Will, it, will yours just tie around? Yeah, so your, yours is not too bad there. Mine's a bit shorter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a hair tie on each end. I'll show you. It's going to look a bit like a Christmas cracker. So mine looks like a Christmas cracker. Then I'm going to fold it in, it, in on itself like this. Okay. Oh, yep. Yep. And then this bit doesn't look fancy, but, but there you go. A piece of cloth and two hair ties. So. All right. The reason I wanted to show you this is because that is the leader of New Zealand, um, the prime minister of New Zealand. She's been in news a lot lately uh, for good reasons. Um, and so, the, the again, the reason I'm showing you this is because we're talking about you know democracies, right? Uh, allow an individual the right of uh, freedom and expression and organization. Uh, what I what I have here for you is um, the Wikipedia uh, Democracy Index. And by the way, I, I try to use sites that, in this case, it's it says Wikipedia, but it's coming from uh, the Economist Intelligence Unit that created that. Uh, so 
there it is, uh, Democracy Index uh, on Wikipedia. So if you look at the, the, the color code here for these countries, you could see that the full democracies are the dark green and then the red, uh, dark red are going to be authoritarian regimes and red are authoritarian regimes. So already you can see already for the, for the Americas uh, what's going on there. And, you know, obviously Venezuela is, is the most red. Um, and um, by the way, look at Russia, right? Authoritarian regime, there's Putin. Uh, China, same thing here. Uh, but if you look at Australia, look at Canada, look at Australia, and you look at New Zealand, you'll see that they're, they're very, very dark green. So let's see what we got going here. Uh, you have a tie, really, in terms of regions for change for, uh, for, for the top. The top spot is Norway, uh, Iceland, and New Zealand. And this is why I put New Zealand in there. Uh, New Zealand has been really, really fun to watch over the years uh, for lots of reasons. The reason I, I highlighted New Zealand is not just because of this whole uh, democracy thing, but when we talk about um, barriers to entry when it comes to trade, there's another reason that I'll bring in New Zealand then, uh, and they'll break away from uh, Norway, Iceland, Sweden, Nord Nordic countries. Um, and so, so, you know, these are what we call full democracies, dark green full democracies. And then you're getting a little bit lighter. So now, you know, if you were to make this a grade, right, nine is, let's say, 90 percent. Right. So, you know, Norway is uh, at, you know, 98.7 percent. That's that's an that's an A plus. Right. Uh, and then you go at uh, the Netherlands, you got an A minus over here. Right. Canada. Yeah, OK. And then we're getting into the B's, right? So here's Luxembourg, Germany, the UK. Uh, we're, we're getting into the B's. Uh, France is getting a B minus. And, uh, you know, Portugal, man, just really sliding with that B there. South Korea on the dot. Oh, no, the US. We're at a C plus, people. And so that's, you know, I'll show you. I'll talk a little bit more about that. We actually slipped uh, in the past four years. We went, uh, we went from being a full democracy to what, what's called a flawed democracy. And before you get all upset, it has a lot to do with how people perceive government. And over the you know, last four years, uh, the perception of our government uh, has you know, deteriorated. And so that, that's how you end up on that list there. Uh, and so again, just kind of showing you, uh, you know, what, what the numbers look like. And you know, you know, we like ranking stuff. So who is at the very bottom? Well, North Korea in this case gets a you know F minus at uh, you know 10 percent, and the DRC, Democratic Republic of the Congo, the CAF. I mean, these are like really just uh, absolutely um, flawed, flawed in many many ways, right? Um, Eritrea uh, down there, I'm just kind of now curious. Uh, because we'll talk about them. Well, Somalia is not even on the list. So there we go. Somalia is not even at all. Uh, it is really a whole other level of um, flawed. Um, okay, so there's that. Totalitarian regime, you probably know who that is. In fact, there's his name there with the attribution to the, the creator of, uh, of the artwork. Um, political system in which one person or party exercises absolute political control over the population. Well, I mean, obviously, I, I, I put uh, Kim Jong-il over here because, uh, as you saw from the ranking, North Korea is at the rock bottom, right? It definitely not suitable for business, uh, suffers from high political risk uh, associated with political change. It may negatively impact domestic and foreign firms. I mean, in this case, it's easy. Nobody's going to go in anyway. Uh, let's see, um, extreme political risk may lead to nationalization, expropriation of foreign assets. So even though we have, uh, you know, a North Korea ranking dead last, uh, let's look at another country real quick. Let's see where uh, Argentina ranks. So Argentina is a flawed democracy, but it's, a, it's, it's you know, ranking, uh, the scores keeps going down, by the way, over the years. So it's another, another drop there. So it's getting a C minus, it's about to get a D plus, right? Uh, and so there's a reason I'm talking about Argentina. And here it is, as we talk about nationalization and expropriation, let me just talk about these two things real quick. Nationalization is when a government uh, decides it's going to um, take over uh, a, um, a business from a multinational usually 
uh, from another country, right? That that operates in its own country. Uh, and expropriation is they just steal it. And nationalization is uh, often there's going to be uh, an exchange of you know compensation, if you will. Um, and so this is from the BBC here. On the streets of Buenos Aires, there appeared to be widespread approval of the decision to nationalize Repsol's stake in YPF. The decision was announced a week ago today. De no producción, de no exploración. President Cristina Fernandez argued that Repsol had failed to invest sufficiently in Argentina's oil industry. But there's still no indication of what sort of compensation shareholders may receive. The European Union has already condemned Argentina's action, but the question is whether foreign ministers meeting today can really do anything further. So there is that. I'm sorry, that's not the video that I had in mind. This is an older one, uh, but it's happened again recently uh, with uh, the nationalization of Argentina of uh, an oil interest from Spain. Uh, let's see. So um, the types of uh, totalitarianism. Let's look at them. Again, what I'm doing here, people, is uh, this is on page 25 of your book. Uh, I'm, I'm really trying to make sure that I help you with the content of the book, bring them up to date as much as I can, and uh, make it, I mean, the stuff is really interesting. So I, I hope it's interesting to you, it's interesting to me. So we have four types of totalitarian uh, regimes, right? First is communist totalitarianism. And so the usual suspects here, China, Cuba, Laos, North Korea, Vietnam, right? Um, it's going to be really interesting because China, for example, uh, we're going to talk more about later on, is more complex than just calling it a communist totalitarian regime. Um, you know, case in point, the difference between, I don't know, China and Cuba, let's say, is uh, that uh, the level of trade is very different, for one. Uh, number two is that you know when, when you have a when you have a stock exchange, China has its own stock exchange. I don't know that you really call yourself communist anymore. So China is interesting. Well, again, we'll talk more about it later. But uh, uh, China is a you know uh, they say communist with capitalistic uh, characteristics, right? Um, and so uh, we'll, we'll talk more about them. Uh, let's see, the, then we have the second one here, right-wing totalitarian regime. Uh, this is uh, usually uh, uh, defined as hatred of uh, uh, communism. Uh, there are none currently. There's no regime that's right-wing. Usually you'll see a uh, military junta uh, running the place, right? Um, and so since World War II, uh, we haven't had any. The, uh, I'm sorry, right after World War II, let me rephrase that. Uh, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, a couple others uh, were right-wing totalitarian uh, regimes. There were countries that were ran by a military dictatorship. Uh, again, uh, all fueled by hatred of communism. Uh, now, I have a picture of the current president of uh, Brazil, uh, Bolsonaro, uh, who uh, was really, uh, you know, had said, made a couple of disturbing uh, quotes, uh, comments about uh, that period, a uh, grim period of um, military dictatorship in Brazil, where he said dictatorship was a very good period. Uh, and so, you know, he's, he's somebody to watch. Uh, you know, there's a kind of a lot going on there. Uh, you know, uh, you can click on the links on your own time if you want to. I, I think here what I have for you is a BBC story about Bolsonaro and uh, that statement that he made. Uh, all right, so then we have the theocratic totalitarianism. So theocracy, obviously, uh, has to do with religion. And the only two uh, remaining uh, theocratic totalitarian regimes in the world are Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, I'll talk more about Saudi Arabia in a little bit. Lastly, uh, tribal uh, totalitarianism. Uh, the book, uh, the author uh, here talks about uh, Rwanda, uh, you know, up to the, you know, uh, uh, 1990s uh, genocide of uh, Rwanda. Uh, in terms of tribal totalitarian regime, I think that was the argument of uh, the tribes uh, that instigated um, uh, the whole thing, which were the Hutus, right? So back then, the president of Rwanda uh, was a Tutsi, and uh, when he uh, his plane was shot down, his jet was shot down, 
uh, and uh, that's when all of the uh, the, the coup uh, initiated, and basically the the, the Hutus and I believe the Twas. Um, uh, this, you know, uh, massacred a bunch of Tutsis, not just Tutsis, by the way. And so uh, I believe the number is up to a million people uh, who were massacred uh, when that happened. So that's, that's the latest example of a tribal totalitarian regime. Uh, again, it's, it's an example of, of, of maybe tribal division in Rwanda, again, between the Tutsis, the Hutus and the Twas. This is all, this is, by the way, not in the book, uh, but you could look it up. Um, but I, I, I don't know that I would uh, call the government of Rwanda up to the genocide uh, tribal totalitarian regime. Um, you know, um, it was more of a, uh, when the Belgians were there and they just uh, had everybody uh, assigned ID based on tribes is when it you know, led to problems. Okay. Um, Moving along, legal systems. Look at these handsome people right there. So this is where we're getting into the legal component of uh, the chapter. Uh, rules of the games on how countries' laws are enacted and, and enforced. Uh, so again, we're talking about the laws. Reduce transaction costs by minimizing uncertainty and combating opportunism. That's why it's so important to have uh, a strong uh, law enforcement and just a legal system and that you also enforce those laws. If you have the laws and you don't enforce them, they're for not. The reason I have a picture of uh, uh, Professor Karp and Professor Chen here is obviously there the, are two uh, full-time uh, lawyers who teach uh, business law at Chiefy College, but they've been amazing. Uh, they also created, I want to bring this up for those of you who are interested uh, with, uh, you know, in this case, um, some uh, some uh, shameless uh, advertising for my colleagues here and for our amazing program. So this is our Chiefy College website. There he is again, action shot of a business law class, right? Uh, and uh, what what they did is they created an award-winning program uh, in the state of California. We Chiefy College now uh, have won. Uh, we you know we have a pathway to law school, which basically, if you are interested in uh, studying law. Um, we have an agreement with law schools. So again, look into look into that where you can get your uh, two years at Chafee, transfer to a four year for another two years, and then those classes that you take as part of the pathway to law school will transfer over to a whole list of uh, law schools in the state of California. Um, all right, so legal systems continued. Uh, you have uh, here the main systems are going to be uh, civil law and common law. Uh, so laws are transplanted from the following legal transition. So the civil law uses comprehensive statutes and codes to form uh, legal judgment. Uh, this is inherited from France. This is a Napoleonic code. And I put boring because it's the best way to remember it. Just remember, in this case, when you look at the, you know, the original civil law uh, as Napoleonic Code, what it does is it doesn't give judges any right to interpretation of the law. They just need to follow the code. That's it. They're basically, uh, you know, all they do is uh, make sure that when something is presented, they review the books and they know which law applies, and that's it. And so the uh, what what the author does here basically says, you know, if you've ever seen a movie where there's, um, I don't know if you watch uh, Law and Order or any of those, uh, and you see a lot of yelling in a courtroom and, you know, these action-oriented, you know, you can't handle the truth, that's never going to be uh, to do with civil law. Uh, that's kind of a very boring process. It's going to have to do with common law. Common law we inherited from Great Britain, uh, shaped by precedents from uh, previous uh, legal decisions, uh, judicial decisions. It's flexible, right? So disputes are resolved based on judges' interpretation of the law. It's a very exciting, and that's where you see all these lawyers jumping around. Uh, so hopefully that helps you remember the two, uh, the two things here. Uh, theocratic law is the third type. So again, going back, we have number one, the civil law, number two, the common law, and number three, theocratic law. So I told you earlier I would, uh, I would kind of circle back to Saudi Arabia, and um, this is where your author uh, you know, talks, uh, applies uh, theocratic law, in this case by highlighting uh, you know, the um, theocratic law that's taken place in Saudi Arabia uh, based on the Quran. Uh, so laws are being relaxed. I just want to kind of give you an update. Um, 
the book talked about, the, see that picture right there, you can see there's a little divider. And that, by the way, is called relaxed because once upon a time, uh, prior to this law uh, that came out in 2019 that ended gender segregation in restaurants, uh, they were, once upon a time, they were, they were McDonald's, as used as an example in your book, where uh, female-only McDonald's, right? Uh, and so um, then it was, you know, different entrants uh, based on, uh, on sex. Uh, you know, men one side, women came through the other side. And so that ended in 2019. Women are allowed to drive. That came out in 2018. Women are allowed to travel abroad without a male guardian. That happened in 2019. So, you know, it, you know, better late than never, right? So, But that's what's happening there in terms of uh, update on some of those laws being relaxed right now in Saudi Arabia. Uh, let's see, property rights. Okay, this is going to be a really, really important one. So, you know, I have a little screenshot at the top right of a mortgage deed, right, a, a deed of trust for a mortgage. So it's the title of the of the of the, uh, of, of the of the land, of the title of the of the house that you 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 buy, you know. Uh, and um, I mean, obviously, you, you have to pay it off. Until you pay it off, it belongs to the bank. But once you know, pay it off, it's yours. Uh, the legal right to use an economic property as a resource and derive income and benefit from it. Now think about how significant that is. Think about that. You know, we, we, we think, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, great. I buy a house, I own it. Yeah, no, I got it. Um, so in this case, you know, we know that a property document is required uh, to pro prosecute violators through legal means. Somebody tries to claim your house, you have proof it's yours, then that's, that's something that protects you. It is an important means to access fund. This is the part I want you to really just consider because that's the one that kind of is taken from for granted. It's the most important source of funds for new startups in the U.S., uh, the mortgage and entrepreneurs' houses. I use the example here of uh, Damon John. He's one of them, uh, one of the people who started his empire uh, by, uh, you know, mortgaging uh, their house. So he and his mother, the mother, I mean, when she, she needs... I'm sure he's hopefully he's been really taking good care of her because she mortgaged the, the house uh, 400 grand uh, in startup capital so that he could uh, create his uh, his uh, clothing brand right and so um, anyway imagine if you're in a country where there's no property rights how do you come up with the cash and this is where the author talks about concept of cash and carry. So these developing countries, until they get the property rights down, it's really going to be challenging for entrepreneurs to you know, pick themselves up as they try to take risk with the new ventures if they don't have access to capital. And you know, in one's lifetime, uh, the most expensive purchase is usually a home, right? Um, all right, so that's for that. Um, it facilitates economic growth. Insecure property rights in developing countries reduce the average firm size. Again, it's the opposite of what we've just talked about, right? Um, and it results in the use of technologies that employ less fixed capital. Uh, they do not entail long-term investment. Again, there's not that significant, you know, uh, you know, if the average house is half a million dollars, 500K, and you're 20 years into that. So maybe you have $300,000 of equity in that home. You have access to $300,000. Uh, if you're a developing economy and you don't have access to those property rights and you need 150 k you're not going to be able to, to come up with that very handily. Uh, let's see, intellectual property, uh, that, that, you know, this is a picture of uh, sriracha. I'm sure everybody's familiar with those little rock bottles here. And so I, there's a reason I have, I have, I'm going to focus on that a little bit. This is an example that I like and not in the book, but I just want to bring that up. Uh, so intellectual property is intangible property that results from intellectual activity. So intellectual property rights is a legal right associated with the ownership of intellectual property, right? It consists of patents. So a patent is a legal right awarded by government authorities to inventors of new product or processes. Pretty straightforward there. Um, copyright, um, authors and publishers. So your textbook, right? Uh, the Global for Global Business by Peng, uh, of course, is a copywritten publication, right? Um, and if you look at the, you know, with the second page, you'll see 2018, 2016, Sandgage Learning, 
ink copyright with a little C that is, uh, you know, in, in, with a circle around, that's how you know that it has a copyright. Um, if you ever want to copyright something on your own without going through a lawyer, uh, you know, it's not guaranteed, but just Google poor man's copyright. That's great. Uh, trademarks. Uh, exclusive legal rights of firms to use specific names, brands, and design to differentiate their product from others. There we go. That's my little sriracha picture that I have for you, for here. By the way, I am attributing credit of the picture uh, to the person uh, who took the picture. That's the fine print below there. Trademark. Um, what's fascinating about the founder of sriracha is that you know he's an immigrant uh, from Vietnam, and in fact, uh, you know, really amazing story is uh, he actually. Um, named uh, these uh, sriracha uh, a bottle he named it uh, after the boat uh, that was used uh, when he uh, fled uh, Vietnam to come to the United States uh, so so what's interesting though is that he, he you know he just built this business from the ground up I think it's almost worth 50 million dollars um, and in sales sorry and and here's something he never did he never ever got trademark for the brand Sriracha. And what it did is it gave free reigns to all these other businesses. And there's countless examples, you can, you can Google them if you want, of chips, of, you know, next time you go to a store and you see Sriracha flavored chips, anything, uh, even fast food, I can't remember if it's Taco Bell, one of them, one of the fast food restaurants, pre, you know, predominantly has this huge sriracha flavored thing. Um, and, and and he is not getting a, a dime from that. He's not getting a dime from that because he never trademarked sriracha. And the reason that he never trademarked sriracha is because it's the name of a town in Thailand uh, that he couldn't trademark. Um, anyway, so that's the story there. Uh, I thought that would be interesting. Uh, intellectual property, intangible nature of intellectual property rights make enforcement difficult. Piracy, unauthorized use of intellectual property rights. I mean, I know a lot of students <laughs> who download music, movies, you know, illegally, right? So, um, example, authorized sharing of music files, deliberate counterfeiting. There we go. I've been told that, that the picture that I have here, I've been told is a counterfeit Louis Vuitton bag. I'm not an expert. I can't tell, but I've been told. By the way, I don't have to give uh, the credit to the picture because, of course, if they're breaking the law, then I don't have to worry about violating their rights. Uh, economic systems. There we go. Uh, rules of the games on how countries govern economically. Uh, the most the obvious one is, you know, the, the market economy, right? Uh, the invisible hands of market forces. Uh, if you remember invisible hands, supply and demand curve, right? Equilibrium, that's your invisible hand. Function that cannot be performed by the private sector is performed by the government in this case, in a market economy. The United States Post Office, there we go. Uh, it is part of the government. Uh, there are things that the private sector can't do entirely well that the government will step in and do, right? Uh, so that's a market economy. Uh, you have a command economy, all factors of production are state-owned and state-controlled, all supply and demand pricing are planned by the government. You know, uh, what you'll find here is that we, we really don't have too many of those around. Uh, in, in, you know, uh, when you look at the uh, command economy, uh, they really all have a flavor of mixed economy. What you do have is you have economies of varying degrees of what it means for them to be a mixed economy. Uh, and so uh, economic freedom index, let's look at that. Uh, again, this is not in the book, I'm, you're welcome. So what I'll do here is I'll, I'll bring that up. Uh, the economic freedom index is fascinating. It's a ranking of uh, basically uh, ease of doing business in the country, right? So this is here the 2020 economic freedom index. Uh, and look at who's number one, Singapore is number one. Um, it's an update from your textbook and for me because Hong Kong 
was number one for decades, which is kind of ironic considering, of course, it's a province of China. But uh, look at number three, New Zealand, right? Remember, there was a reason I told you earlier. There's a reason I'm going to focus on New Zealand. New Zealand is fascinating. And sure it is, uh, sure enough, uh, you know, it, it, it ranks number one uh, uh, for democracy, but it also ranks at the top for Economic Freedom Index. What does that mean? Well, at the very top, uh, the free uh, going from 80 to 100, uh, 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 the highest level of Economic Freedom Index. So Singapore, Hong Kong, New Zealand, Australia, uh, Switzerland, Ireland, uh, especially when you look at Singapore, let's say, and Hong Kong, way, way up there, right? Uh, what it means is that if you as an American, let's say you want to open up a store in those countries and you fly there, they make it comically easy. All you have to do is uh, pay your fee. Uh, if it's still the same, I can speak at least uh, to, to Hong Kong, if it's still the same that it was the last I researched this, uh, the, the, it's one piece of paper. You fill out one piece of paper, boom, that same day you can be in business. Um, and so, so that's an example of the Economic Freedom Index, right? And so, you know, the United States, of course, we're, we're coming at number 17. Uh, you see the little red slight drop. Uh, and, and what it means is that, yeah, we, we I mean, we're, we're great. Everybody comes to the U.S., but we can't say we're going to make it as easy as the other countries, uh, even Canada, that makes it you know easier than us, and then of course you know you can you know, scroll down and you can see again North Korea, Venezuela, Cuba, Economic Freedom Index is in the toilet over there, um, and so that's that's one of the ways of kind of coming up with a range of a mixed economy, and that's what I wanted to do for you to show you variations of mixed economy by Economic Freedom Index because. The, the lower you go on that list, the more it will have to do with institutions, i.e. government. Okay, so what drives economic uh, development? Uh, culture, geography, institutions. Uh, we'll spend way more time on that uh, in the future, but that's, you know, total no-brainer, right? These three tenets together are going to be what drives economic development, culture, uh, you know, in terms of culture mixed, by the way, with the economy, but what do people like? What do they want? Uh, the topography, the geography of the place, where it's located, how accessible, is it part of even a, you know, your trade block maybe? And of course, the institutions, I know we've talked about that. Um, and then uh, what are the importance uh, of the role of institutions, international business, right? So you have your formal market supporting uh, institutions, they encourage individuals to specialize and firms to grow in size. Uh, they protect property rights and fuel innovation, entrepreneurship, and economic growth. So what happens when you don't have that? This is, this is what happens in the U.S. This is what happens with New Zealand, all these other countries, right? They encourage people to specialize and firms to grow in size, protect property rights. People feel you know, confident that they can take risk because they're going to be protected, right? Uh, but what happens when you lack that? What happens when you don't have those strong institutions, right? Uh, it forces people to trade on an informal basis with a small neighboring group. Um, and, and that's when, you know, even there's uh, all these interesting documentaries about North Korea where people do sell. There are entrepreneurs. They're on the streets, especially uh, the Korean border to China on the north, north side of Korea. Lots and lots of entrepreneurs out there you know, hawking their goods on the streets to other Koreans uh, way, you know, and, and, and having their own support network almost, right? So, uh, as we kind of sum things up, what's the implication for action over here for us? What does that all mean? Uh, well, when entering a new country, do your homework. Understand the formal institutions governing firm behavior. And when you're doing business in a country with a strong propensity for informal relation exchange, uh, don't insist on formalizing contract right away or it could really backfire. What we'll learn about later on uh, is we'll learn about, again, th these, these really interesting kind of spectrums uh, that show you um, how people do business throughout the world. And the idea is going to be uh, whether or not uh, things are said explicitly or if they're implied. Let me explain. In some cultures, uh, you know, think about Germany, Switzerland, the US, 
we love contracts if it's not you know you've heard it before right if it's not in writing it doesn't exist we love contracts so think about that as something that's being formalized right but what happens if I operating in a country that still does things via handshake that you know they they operate based on trust right well good for you but I want you to sign right and that's what that means if you were to insist on having them sign the document the contract and here they just want to you know close this multi-million dollar deal on a handshake which by the way does still happen um, you will we'll talk about that later but Asia many many places in Asia still do business that way on trust uh, then that could obviously backfire because the uh, perception would be that you don't trust them and if you don't trust them then we're not gonna do business okay that concludes everything there's all these uh, key terms here make sure that um, Again, uh, before you take the quiz uh, at the end of the week on Friday, make sure that you get those terms out of the way. Uh, I, I recommend flashcards. Um, you know, I all of them here have been covered. Uh, once you get the key terms out of the way, then make sure you understand the content, right, in terms of the summary content. So these are things we've talked about. Uh, again, we're, what I'm doing here is what the author has for us is a summary of what we did uh, make sure that this is a great way of asking yourself, am I clear on all these things? Do I have all these things committed to memory? And do I have a crisp understanding of that? And that's it for us. So, uh, well, kept it under one hour. Again, please, I know I should have said this at the top, but feel free to stop the video, take breaks whenever you need. I will see you guys um, again for chapter three.